Okay, we are going to, uh, so for those of you who are new, last year we studied worship and everything about worship except the music part of worship. This year in Bible studies, we're tackling the, the music parts of worship. So we've talked about um, God's creative gift of music and music and emotion and music and meaning and a variety of things in the last few months. And then Eric taught um, when I was in Turkey uh, a few weeks ago about singing and God's gift of singing and calling for us to sing together. And you know, when you look at all that stuff, <clears throat> you, would, you could conclude that church music is a really simple thing. Like, it's just music is a gift from God, just sing together. Like, that's kind of all there is to it. But in reality, we all know church music is somehow a very, very complicated thing, and sometimes a very controversial thing. So, the next couple studies in our series on music, I'm going to give us a brief overview of selective parts of recent American worship history. Uh, I don't know if that all made sense, but um, we can't study all of church music history, um, nor can we study all of American church music history, but there are three big things I'd like to talk us through uh, today. And uh, what we really want to see is how church music, church wor gathered worship, pretty radically changed in the last 75 years. And how that happened, what some of the forces were in that, in that change, and what passages of Scripture drove those changes. So, I know that any attempt to talk about history is woefully brief. That's just unavoidable, but that doesn't mean it can't be helpful for us. So, the content I'm going to talk through today comes primarily from a, a book that, um, I don't know, is it sitting over there somewhere? <laughs> yeah. Books, belts, you know. <laughs> it's one of those days. It's this book. It's a, uh, it's a, History of Contemporary Praise and Worship by Lester Ruth and Lim Sui Hong. Um, and it is a careful history of um, the two of the two of the major factors that have influenced American worship. And it's just a good book because a lot of when I, whenever I read a book like this, I'm I'm betting they're gonna have a big chip on their shoulder about something in writing it. And this book just doesn't. They just work through the history well. And what I especially love is that they understand that the roots of these changes came from Scripture. Doesn't always mean it was healthy or good, but they, they really work at demonstrating the Bible reasons for the changes. And that's great, because so many people who write about religion miss the most important things that actually motivate Christians in these areas. So, um, it's a good book. Of course, I don't agree with all of it, but their history, they do a good job. And their title, okay, their title is A History of contemporary praise and worship, and they are fully aware that they've made up the phrase contemporary praise and worship, but they've made it up on purpose because they're combining two things, two major streams that have powerfully impacted American congregational worship, and that is the praise and worship stream and the contemporary worship stream. And their point is that those two different streams, which massively impacted church worship in the last 75 years, have in many churches kind of merged. And the result is what we know of as the most common forms of congregational worship in American evangelicalism today. So, um, so they suggest that there are two, so basically it's this praise and worship plus contemporary worship equals a transformation of worship. Not that those are the only two factors, but it's, it is two major streams. Um, and so they call the result contemporary praise and worship. They give a couple little words to help us start understanding these two streams. For praise and worship, the first word is presence. Uh, this movement focused on how God's people could expect to experience God's presence in worship. And the second word is gift, that um, they viewed praise and worship as a gift from God, restoring true worship or restoring His presence in worship through this gift of, of praise and worship. And then the two words they suggest for um, contemporary worship are the words purpose and gap. This movement really focused on using relevant worship for the purpose of reaching the lost, having an outreach purpose, and especially using music to close the gap between the church and unsaved, unsaved people. So, um, much of what we know of as 
worship today in America comes from those two influences, though there are others, and I need to just stop saying that because I've said it enough times. Um, now, you probably want to know, okay, so Pastor Tim, are you saying that these changes have been good or bad? Like, what's your point? Are you criticizing these changes or are you applauding these changes? Well, first of all, remember we studied gathered worship last year. So if you want to know what we believe the Bible teaches about the purpose of gathered worship, the people in gathered worship, what you do in gathered worship, um, we, we covered all that last year. So I'm not trying to like teach all that or recover that territory today. And really, my goal is just to help us understand where we're at. When something as important as congregational worship changes so radically, so fast, then of course you want to say, hmm, what happened? It doesn't mean the changes are bad, but at least we ought to stop and say, wait, what, what did change? Why did it change? What was the Bible that drove these changes? So that then we can evaluate ultimately what God would have us do as a church family. So maybe to your frustration, my point today isn't really going to be trying to critique every part of this as much as just help us understand where we're at today. So let's start with praise and worship. The authors of this book trace the roots of this back to the 1940s, a Pentecostal preacher um, who was very frustrated by the lack of revival. He was speaking at a church, and it was like nothing was happening, and he was crying out to the Lord, trying to figure out what was wrong, and he came across Psalm 22.3. That thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. So from that verse, he made a connection between praise and God's presence. And he concluded that when we praise, God's presence comes. And then he connected that to Hebrews 13, verse 15, which says, Let us offer the sacrifice of praise. So praise is a sacrifice. Praise is costly, and so he thought, that means that we have to praise whether we feel like it or not. You don't wait till you feel like praising, you just start praising, which is, of course, true and right. And so then he combined those two ideas together and began teaching that it is sacrificial praise that leads to God's presence. If we come to, if we come to God in praise, no matter how we feel, and we start praising Him, then God will come and inhabit those praises. And um, he, he concluded that this was what he called the secret to God's presence that had been missing, that this was why revival had been lacking. Um, now, at this point, I will stop and critique for just a second, <laughs> um, because we spent a lesson on this a year ago, um, the presence of God in gathered worship. And oh, I'm not going to go through all that again, but uh, this line of thinking was right in that praise is something we should offer to God no matter how we feel. That is an absolutely legitimate point. And when we gather for worship, it's important for us to bring our sacrifice of praise to God no matter how we feel, uh, if, even if the week was really hard, even if we're struggling, even if we maybe feel distant from the Lord. Praise is this beautiful sacrifice that we must bring to God. That part was right. The connection to God's presence was pretty off track. Um, he was misunderstanding Psalm 22.3. Um, it doesn't, it's not promising what he thought it was promising. It's a, it is a picture of God's people, of God enthroned with his people, praising him there in his enthronement. But um, so he was off track with that part. Now, that doesn't mean that God is not present in gathered worship. We gave like 12 different reasons why we know God is present in a special way in gathered worship. But it's not because God comes as a response to the sacrifice of praise. It's because the church is indwelt by the Spirit. It is the body of Christ. It is the temple of God that gathers together. The Word of God is preached. There are many reasons why God is present. It's just not this reason um, that He was uh, promoting. But back to our history. So, one of the sad things is that this idea started to be viewed as a restoration of true worship. And that ought to just be a red flag for you right away. Anytime somebody says, hey, the church has been missing something for a long time, and now we've found it. Or somebody starts using a word like secret, you need to have a lot of red flags go up. And so this got actually pretty bizarre pretty fast. The, the word gift, this connected to the latter rain movement, 
the word gift became very prominent, that praise and worship is a new gift from God, restoring His presence to the church. Now, that is a bad thing to say, okay? As if God's presence has been missing from generations of Christians, and now we just got it back. That was really not healthy. And there were even people who taught things like that all of the Old Testament feasts and festivals had been fulfilled except the festival of the Feast of Tabernacles, and that now in the 1940s, God had fulfilled the Feast of Tabernacles in this true restoration of true worship. That, that stuff was bad, not good, um, not healthy. But, but the general idea that if we praise God, then we'll come into the presence of God, that general idea really started to take on, to catch on and spread. And before long, it started to be really thought of as a sequence from praise to worship praise, then worship. And there were even a number of teachers who tried to take the use of the words praise and worship in the Bible and kind of show that they were trying to show that there was a Bible order in that, which I I really don't think is the case. But um, this started to kind of be the thinking that if we, we, we start with, we gather as a church, we start with praise, and we offer that sacrifice first. And then as time goes along in the service, we begin to come into God's presence, or God sends his, the gift of His presence, and then in God's presence, we begin to worship. And so, here we can start noting a few of the ways that connected to music. First of all, this really increased the importance of music in the service, because both praise and worship were primarily uh, connected to, to music. And so, musicians needed to be able to create a kind of a flow of music a flow of songs, maybe even an hour-long um, flow of, of music that kept connecting together to, to lead the congregation through praise and into the presence of God in worship. And, and so then there were lots of practical ramifications of that, like, like the need for songs with different tempo and energy level. So the, the kind of normal pattern started to be start the service with stuff that's light and energetic and happy and cheerful, and then as you go along, you move more into stuff that's more deeply emotional and, and intimate and thoughtful and passionate to express uh, love for God. Along with that, choruses started to become much more prominent. Instead of maybe like a hymn where you'd have a lot of thoughts you've got to think through, um, just simpler choruses that could be uh, upbeat choruses at the beginning and then, and then very kind of passionate um, expressions of love for God and stuff later in the worship portion. So, um, that's, that's just kind of a few samples of the ways music was directly connected to, to, to the early praise and worship. So, what I'm talking about so far is 1940s, 1950s, into the early 1960s, um, but then it was the middle of the 1960s through the middle of the 1980s when praise and worship became extremely influential, and some of you were there then. So, this will be very, very well known uh, to you. Um, I mean, I guess I was there then, but not until 77, so I don't remember much. Um, which, again, is, is a good reminder that I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, pre-me history. So, um, once I was born, I know everything. Okay, let's… Okay, so… There was that original biblical foundation of Psalm 22.3… Hebrews 13, 15. Now, let me just give you samples of how the kind of the biblical foundation was, um, was added to. There was, there was more concrete poured under the praise and worship foundation. So, um, so we already talked about Psalm 22, 3 and Hebrews 13, 15. That's the first two lines up here. Um, a verse that was added to this was Hebrews 2, 12. And Hebrews 2, it's, this is Jesus. This is the Son of God saying this. He says, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise, which is quoting a psalm. And so, that was taken to mean, again, it was kind of like, oh, oh, here we have it again. We have presence and praise. And so, that was taken to mean, uh, to be like further evidence that if we praise, then Jesus will come and be present. And I mean, you can see that's not quite what the verse says, but it was kind of like, oh, there's those two ideas again, a presence and praise. And then it was you know, made sense to connect that with Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered in my name. Well, if they gather to praise, then Jesus is going to come 
be uh, present um, among them. Another key verse, and you'll recognize this right away because of the praise chorus that probably most of us know from this verse, and we sing at church sometimes, Psalm 104, enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. What do you know? We have presence and praise uh, in a verse again. So, once again, this was taken to mean that if you praise, you'll enter into God's God's presence. Notice the word courts. This verse is the language of tabernacle or temple especially. Enter his gates and then into the courts. This is, so this is the, a, a psalm for, for the Jewish people as they're coming to the temple. It's picturing this coming to God in the temple. And so another thing that became a big, it was, it was kind of like a taught at conferences and, and a lot of things, was, was a, a tabernacle or temple model of worship. So, picturing gathered worship as a journey through the tabernacle or through the temple, with the idea that that was true worship. True worship is a journey through the tabernacle or through the temple. So, you start by coming to the gates with thanksgiving, and then you come into the outer courts with praise, and then as you do that, you're getting closer to the temple itself and the holy place, and then the holy of holies where the presence of God is. So the service, the, the gathered worship of the church, as time goes along in the service, you're moving through into the presence of God. And that was kind of t- taught as like true biblical uh, worship. <clears throat> and that was, there were, there's more here than I can teach, but there is in Acts chapter 15 a promise of the restoration of David's tent. And so there were Bible teachers who started teaching that praise and worship is the fulfillment of that promise in Amos 9 and Acts 15, that God's going to restore the tabernacle of David. God restored it in the 1900s in the restoration of praise and worship to the church, which restores us to God's presence. You got it? Um, now, again, I, these, are, these are brothers and sisters in Christ, and the point is not to bash and criticize. Way back at the roots of this was a misunderstanding of the presence of God in worship that unfortunately kind of tainted the thinking of the whole thing. Not that it was all bad, but that there was a misunderstanding, a misinterpretation of Scripture, and you can see it kind of carried on in more misinterpretations of Scripture um, as, it, <clears throat> as it went along. Now, so what were then some of the practical developments, again, especially as they relate to music? I'm trying to show us biblical developments and then practical developments. So just a few things. Uh, One, um, so praise then was viewed just, praise became synonymous with music. Um, And worship was mostly music. So, and this partly comes from the tabernacle because it's there in tabernacle worship and then temple worship that David seems to have set up the, the choir master and all the instrumentalists and all this music that went into tabernacle, tabernacle worship. Um, and so it became just kind of assumed that praise is musical praise. And so praise songs, of course, in the you know, 70s and 80s, praise songs were huge. Praise choruses were, were huge. When I was a kid taking piano lessons, I had one of the early Maranatha praises books. And I played so many choruses out of Maranatha praises. Um, and so, you know, choruses like we bring the sacrifice of praise, right? That's all the stuff we're talking about here. It's upbeat, it's light, gets you going at the beginning of the service, it's simple to sing, it's a chorus, and it has this idea that we come first with the sacrifice of praise, and then we'll come um, and uh, we'll come into, come now is the time to worship. We'll get to that later after we enter his gates with thanksgiving. And um, so, the the worship part of the service, how much of that was worship depended on the type of church that you went to. Um, some churches, that would be almost all worship. Other churches might move into um, the, the use of spiritual gifts um, during the worship portion. So, the idea was that once you've come into God's presence later in the service, now God's presence is there, which means God's power is there. So now later in the service is the time for um, you might have spirit-inspired songs, like the worship leader might 
a light, um, right, you know, not right, but come up with a song from the Spirit on the spot. You may have people speaking in tongues. You may have people prophesying. You may have healings. You may have spiritual deliverance. So some churches wouldn't, you'd, you'd probably have like music going kind of in the background underneath that, but there may be other things going on like a healing or other things like that. And the idea that was that because we've come into God's presence, now God's power is here. So now we can, we can kind of have the, the, the power portion of the of the worship. Not all denominations did those things, um, but uh, some. Um, okay, this then really amped up the increased importance of church musicians. Because, okay, so if, think with me, if, if, if when we gather, what we do is we go on a journey through the temple into the presence of God, and it's musicians who take us there, then what are those musicians? Like in the Bible picture, what are those musicians? They're priests bringing the people into the presence of God. And so this just really amped up the importance of the role of musicians. And the most important role was this new role of worship leader. No one had really used the term worship leader before the praise and worship movement. Um, uh, Bob Coughlin, who is no critic of praise and worship, um, says, if you were born after 1980, you probably don't remember when the term worship leader didn't exist. But that designation really didn't emerge until the early 1970s. I don't think anyone back then had a clue how the thinking, structure, and practices of the church would come to be dominated by worship music and worship leaders. And again, he's not saying that negatively. If you read the rest of page 51, he's actually pretty positive about those changes. But it's good for us to see those words. No one had a clue how the thinking, structure, and practices of the church would come to be dominated by worship music and worship, worship leaders. So worship leaders were very important for a couple of reasons. First of all, you couldn't just have pastors lead worship anymore because they didn't have the musical skills to pull that off for an hour. And, and just shift between songs and go into the background and then come to the foreground. And it took a ton of musical skill to do that. And second of all, the, the worship leader was the, most of all the, the priest bringing people to God. This, this quote is from one, um, I didn't put it on there, but one influential praise and worship book in the 1980s said this, the worship leader must know where he is, where he is going, and when he arrives. See, that's the language of the temple. It's the worship leader who needs to know when we're outside the gates, when we've come through the gates into the courtyard, when we've started to come into God's presence in worship, and it's the worship leader who has to know when we get there and when God's presence has come. So that's all that kind of temple imagery for the worship service. Um, uh, Okay, so much more we can talk about here. I haven't even touched on musical style and how it relates to all this. We're going to get to that in, in a later week. But hopefully this gives us a little taste of how praise and worship um, helped us shape congregational worship. So let's go back to the history for a minute because um, it's not a surprise that praise and worship was very important here in Southern California. That's why all of us are so familiar with it. I think almost all of us hear these things and we're like, oh, right. Like, this is what is, has become um, gathered worship. And um, so those of you who are a little bit older, you're going to know, a, a, you're going to know names like Jack Hayford and John Wimber, of course, Chuck Smith, who combined some of the praise and worship ideas with, you know, Bible, careful Bible teaching and has impacted many here in our church family um, in, in very good ways. There were major, in the 1980s, there were major praise and worship conferences here in Southern California, some that are kind of still well-known till today. Like, there was one where, if you know Jack Hayford's song, Majesty, I was introduced at a praise and worship conference here in Southern California. Um, the, of course, the Jesus People Movement, Chris and I just watched Jesus Revolution this week, the Jesus People Movement and praise and worship um, overlapped in several different ways. Maranatha Music, was started first as a label for some of the bands associated with Calvary Chapel, but within a decade, 
They realized the opportunity they had to equip churches for praise and worship. So Maranatha really shifted what they were doing in that first decade and began to, to feed a lot of worship music and stuff out to local churches and equip them for praise and worship. Um, so there are all these Southern California connections, but it wasn't just a Southern California thing. Like Promise Keepers would have a praise and worship pre-conference before pr- the Promise Keepers rally in different places around the country to equip churches for praise and worship. So we're not talking about like a little niche thing. We're talking about a a huge influence on American evangelicalism um, as praise and worship really shaped what churches did today. Um, And again, my point's not really to evaluate. I hope I've made it clear that I think there are a number of things here that were good and healthy, and there are also some really foundational things that are, that are, that are not biblically good and right in, in some of these things we're talking about, especially the, some of these last things about the priestly role and the uh, just not, not good, not good things. So it, it was a mix, and the way it influenced churches was it was a mix. It's, you can't stereotype this stuff. All right, <clears throat> so <clears throat> in the book, what they're arguing is that Today, many churches have been influenced by praise and worship and this other stream of contemporary worship. So let's jump to that now. So, um, and here's one way that they kind of summarize how to think through the two streams. Praise and worship said, basically, if we praise Him, God will come. Contemporary worship said, basically, if we change it, they will come. Um, People will come. And while there were a number of different verses used for praise and worship, the verse for contemporary worship was 1 Corinthians 9, 22, I become all things to all people, <clears throat> that by all means I might save uh, some. And so the idea was that if we change our worship, we'll reach people for Christ. Now, it wasn't a great understanding of that verse and what Paul was saying in that verse. Um, and again, remember last year we studied the purposes for gathered worship, who is there for gathered worship, all those things. So I'm not going to rehash that this morning. Let's keep going with the history. The key word we mentioned earlier was the word gap. How can we close the gap with lost people? And for any of us who love Jesus and understand what the Bible teaches in places like 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2, the gap with lost people is heartbreaking for us. That is, that is a, something that is very meaningful to us, sad to us. So the question was, what if we use the music that they know and love? And it had become common in the 1800s to use music in evangelism. If you're familiar with names like Charles Finney, if you're familiar at all with the, like the camp meeting movement in, in 19th century American Christianity, um, by early, like first decade of the 1800s, there were something like 500 different camp meetings going on around the U.S. That was a massive uh, change in, in American uh, evangelicalism. And, and some of those camp meetings, or maybe many of those camp meetings, were basically evangelistic worship, was what they were. And one of the surprising influences along these lines was Catherine Booth. You probably know her name because of the Salvation Army, right? But she was actually, it's, today it's easy for us to not realize that the Salvation Army basically started tons of churches, chapels. Um, There's one in Marietta, I think, still, a Salvation Army chapel. And so they actually had a pretty significant influence on worship, and Catherine Booth was really passionate about worship. So here's something she said. This is in 1879. The masses of the people have come to associate ideas of stiffness, formality, and uninteresting routine with our church worship. And if we are to be co-workers with God for them, we must become all things to them in order to win them. So that's 1879, but that's the heart of contemporary worship. And some of you will know the name Amy Semple McPherson, who was a megachurch leader here in L.A. Uh, uh, before any of us were around. Um, she wrote, and she was heavily, Amy Semple McPherson was heavily influenced by the Salvation Army. So she wrote this, The methods often used to impart religion were too archaic, too sedate, and too lifeless ever to capture the interest of the throngs. I developed methods which have brought hundreds of thousands to meetings who otherwise would never have come. 
<clears throat> so that's early 1900s. Another influence in the mid-1900s was the developing idea of generations. And I think you're probably familiar with, um, you know, generations like Gen X and millennials and things like that. You probably know that nobody talked like that until the mid-1900s, until the post-World War II era. Even the idea of teenagers as their own unique generation was pretty new in the mid-1900s. And so some Christians really latched onto that terminology and started to ask, how can we reach the younger generations? The, the idea of generations really kind of pictures these gaps between generations. So it really heightened that sense of there's a gap here. We've got to bridge this gap. And especially, how do we bridge the gap to younger generations? How could we change our worship to bridge the gap? And so organizations like Youth for Christ started to really strongly emphasize keeping up with the musical trends and using modern music to reach teenagers. And basically the idea was, you think church is boring? You think church is outdated? Come listen to our music, and we will show you that we are not outdated. We'll show you that Jesus is actually pretty cool um, through our music. One of the most common ways that was expressed was the idea that music is a language, and so you've got to speak the language of the people you want to reach if you're going to reach them. And so by, by the 1970s, evangelical churches started to either incorporate contemporary worship elements into what they were doing or, um, you know, the huge trend in the 80s and 90s was to have separate services, a contemporary worship service for younger generations and a traditional worship service for the old people who don't like that music. Um, and one thing a lot of people don't know, which is part of the problem, is that some of the most influential churches actually moved their church service for Christians to Sunday night or Wednesday night so that Sunday morning could be a dedicated evangelistic worship service. The problem was a lot of churches copied that and didn't realize what was going on, and they just took church and turned it into an evangelistic worship service. So, like, that's what Bill Hybels did, if you're familiar with Bill Hybels at Willow Creek. Willow Creek's church service was on Wednesday nights. Sunday morning was just outreach. But you can guess how the attendance worked for that you know, the difference between their Sundays and then what happened on Wednesday night. So that influence was really not, not, not great. Um, uh, so in those contemporary services, they paid attention to everything from the dress of the worship leaders, you know, to the appearance of the room, to the architecture, but most of all it was music. That, that had to be up to date. And so churches began tracking the musical trends and culture and making sure that their church worship was up to date with the trends so that they could reach people for Christ. So that's where the term contemporary worship comes from. Contemporary means we're tracking the trends in the culture because we need to keep up with them in order to reach people. And many of those most important influences in contemporary worship are right here in Southern California. Some of them are names that almost none of us would know, names like Donald McGavran and Peter Wagner, Fuller Seminary, which was really like incubator for many of these ideas. But some of you will know the name Robert Schuller because some of you have been there and seen Crystal Cathedral. It's unfortunately, it's a, it's a Catholic church these days um, over there in Orange County. But Schuller was massively influential on people like Bill Hybels and Rick Warren on, through the conferences and leadership network and he had huge, huge influence. It was his influence that impacted people. So Schuler and Fuller impacted Rick Warren, who became famous for going door-to-door -door in Orange County and asking unsaved people, what do you want in church? And then building the largest church in America um, at Saddleback. So, and then Warren was tremendously influential. Uh, where's that? Where do I have that quote? I'm just going to jump ahead. So you're familiar with Purpose Driven Life, which was for, I think, quite a while, the best-selling nonfiction book in history. So Warren also wrote Purpose Driven Church, and he said in Purpose Driven Church, music may also be the most influential factor in determining who your church reaches for Christ and whether or not your church uh, grows. So when we came to California 21 years ago, um, Outreach Magazine was a big deal. It was published from right here in um, Escondido. 
Outreach Magazine put out a list of the, I think, top 100 fastest growing churches in America every year. And you could get Outreach Magazine every month to really teach you how to change your worship to become one of those fast growing churches. And so when we came to Menifee in early 2000s, that was really the, that was the dominant kind of vibe in American evangelicalism was um, how can we change to reach as many people as possible for Christ? How can we change worship to reach as peop- many people as we can for Christ? And so there was a season there where if you didn't get on board as a pastor and change your church worship, or one, you're going to get left behind, and two, you are going to be viewed as not even caring about the gospel. Because if you really cared about the gospel, you would do whatever you had to do in your worship to reach people for Christ. Um, so I hope you can hear those sentences and s- something there goes, mm. <laughs> like there's something that's not right there. And we talked last year about what's not right about that. In the end, the influence of these two streams has merged and become defining features of much of American American worship today. And so that's why they're calling in general, American evangelicalism is characterized today by contemporary um, praise and praise and worship. So that's part of how we got here. Um, and I hope that as you've listened to that today, you've had what it was for me in studying and learning about these things is just a lot of aha moments. Like, oh, I see. That's why that was done. That's why that was said that way. Um, And the reason why we want to see how we got here is because then we can start evaluating, well, what should we do? Because remember, we talked about this earlier, what category does music fit into? The Bible does not define this music is bad, this music is good. Now, when you get to something like lyrics, the Bible does. But when you're talking about music, the Bible does not define this music is good, this music is bad. You've got to take Bible principles and apply them and make the choices God would have you make. It fits into the category of Christian liberty, which is the category of things in which the Bible doesn't de- specifically define what to do. Each believer has the responsibility before God, based on the Scriptures, to do what God would have them do. Christian liberty isn't the liberty to do whatever you want to do. It is the freedom to not have other brothers and sisters who can mandate for you what you do. It's the responsibility before God, what would God have me do? That is music's category. And so what that means for church music is that church music decisions are ultimately a responsibility of local churches. We're not responsible for what another church does. We're not ultimately responsible to figure out whether what they're doing is good or bad or right or wrong. Though there are certain things that are so unbiblical that, you know, they have to get called out as unbiblical. But in general... Each church is responsible for God to say, God, what would you have us do? How should we most, how could we best honor you with how we gather as a church and, and sing to the Lord? And so that's why it's helpful to go back and look at the history so that you don't just do stuff because it's what everybody does, but you be thoughtful about what God would have us do that would honor him. That does not for a moment mean that here at GBC we've got it all figured out and we do it all right. I'm just trying to express to you our heart before the Lord to say, Lord, what would you have us do? And understanding some of the history is one of the ways we ask that question. What would you have us do instead of just kind of adopting what's been done? All right, four minutes. I'm crazy enough to see if anybody has a question. Yes, ma'am. Don't know what I just said, but <laughs> Christian liberty, Christian liberty is not the freedom to do whatever I want to do. It is the freedom from other believers mandating what I have to do. And so it's my responsibility before God, based on His Word, to discern what God wants me to do. And that's what applies to everything from dress to music to movies to all sorts of decisions like that. They fit into that category of Christian liberty. Does that, good, okay, somebody else?
All right. Yes, sir. Question so much as a yeah. comment. Yeah. Um, when we came to DCC years ago, we came from the contemporary Christian worship. Mm -hmm. I, that's all we sang and listened to growing up. Right. And I was a little bit like put off at first mm -hmm. from the hymns, but also because of like what you were mentioned about worship is stuffy and it's stiff, and, and that's what I kind of grew up in. Right. Mm. At first, but God did a work in me and in Tammy too of going, wow, there's so much truth in this, and it's actually so much better than what I used to sing. Mm. So much what I used to sing was just this mantra that I'm repeating over and over again, and mm. the music is meant to make you feel mm. these things, and you start to realize, like um, I was mentioning about um, a contemporary worship song we sang. We went to this conference and. There's just five words sung over and over and over again for five minutes, and it's mm -hmm. people in front of us are raising their hands, and I'm like, what's going on? Like, mm -hmm. this makes no sense since there's no doctrine here, there's no worship. We're just singing a mantra, and it's mm -hmm. like getting you psyched up, you know, for this next part. And I'm like, it feels icky. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't mm -hmm. feel like you're teaching me anything through mm -hmm. this. And that's where that shift came for me was is these hymns where I can sing them and I can feel God's work actually teaching me and actually that presence of him in mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. yeah good good thank you for sharing that one of the things I do I love about GBC is just there's such diversity of backgrounds in in the people here such diversity and um I I pray that by God's grace we're just we're not a church with a chip on our shoulder whose direction is set by a reaction to something. We're not swinging away from contemporary worship or old stuffy traditional worship and trying to just go somewhere else other than that, <laughs> right? That's not what is motivating us. It's, it's we're instead a group of people from very diverse backgrounds musically, and our heart is just, how could we as a church family please Christ? You know, and that's just a, if God can keep that heart, I think that's a, that's a beautiful thing and can make it meaningful. Everybody has to, I picture us like, like a rubber bands in church life. In church life, everybody has to stretch outside of what would be our 100% little comfort zone for us. You don't get to be in your 100% little comfort zone in church. Everybody's got to stretch. And when we all stretch toward Christ and <laughs> what's biblical, that's when it can really be a beautiful beautiful thing. So thank you, Jeremy, for sharing that. Daniel. <clears throat> I think one of the big things with contemporary music was an emphasis on personal um, like personal relationship and personal worship, but in the corporate setting, kind of. Mm. I'm thinking of like Carry Out Your Worship or Hungry, you know that song? Yeah, so that's, that's not the contemporary influence. That's the praise and worship influence that merged into the contemporary, yeah. right? So the, the praise and worship was, and, and in some ways rightfully, the problem with the stuffy whatever was that it wasn't genuine for too many people. It was just church motions, right? And praise and worship brought back this like restoration of genuineness of me and God and closeness to God, which was so good and so right and so necessary. But then when you morph that into the contemporary worship idea that we want to have a service where nobody's uncomfortable, we just want you to be able to have a private worship experience by yourself and nobody else has to bother you, now we're way off track because the gathered worship of the church isn't about me and I don't have to worry about you, leave me alone while I have a worship experience. So that's actually a great example of where the streams merged. Don't want to make people uncomfortable give them this private worship experience, but now we've lost what current gather worship is in the process. I guess part of the question, this is a comment and a question, but um, is there a place for that sort of, I mean, we see in some songs where it's, we're personalizing it, I, uh -huh. uh, but not a lot, right? Uh, but is there a place for those kinds of somewhat individual experiences within 
Because God's obviously working in everyone's heart in uh-huh. the ways as we're seeing. Uh-huh. Um, so I guess just wanted to get your thoughts on Yeah. I, I think we probably went to an extreme <clears throat> in the wrong way. Sure. Then where's kind of the middle ground? Well, I mean, that brings up, first of all, it's really helpful for us to remember the difference between the it's helpful to remember that gathered worship isn't the entirety of your musical worship. So not all music has to be for gathered worship. So there can be worship music that is much more worded in the sense of I that may be great in the car and not as great at church. It doesn't make it a bad or good song. It's just different purposes. Um, so on the church side, and Eric, you can chime in on this if you want, and then we're going we're gonna to have to finish here. But on the church side, we're going to definitely have a preference for the we songs as gathered worship, um, knowing that it's not hard for most people to personalize the we, because the we includes me um, in that. But that doesn't mean we have a rule against I songs you know, we, we don't sing in Jesus, thank you, lover of our soul. We, we sing lover of my soul. So we're not afraid of that, though our preference is going to be to stay in the we, us category in gathered worship. I just pulled up one of my spreadsheets, and one of, the, one of the things I track is that corporate versus individual language as we're selecting new songs to add into our repertoire and try to keep that balance. Um, I haven't updated this in a while, so... Sure. Sure. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not repeating this stuff for the recording. It's okay. It's t- you're talking too long. I can't. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So we do track the individual versus corporate language as we're selecting uh, new songs to add. And so this is not totally up to date, but um, of what is that? Uh, about 140 songs. Um, 70 use individual I me language. 52 are corporate. We us and 10 are some combination of the two back and forth. So it's, a, it's about a 50-50 mix of the two, but that, that is something we try to keep track of and balance. Don't the songs go back and forth? Hmm. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we gotta be done after these two. One Kevin. question. Uh, you yeah. said you went through this last year. Was that a sermon or was Sunday school? <coughs> those were sermons. Yes, those are all on the website. Yeah, the worship series. Mm-hmm. Yolanda. Yeah, we, we will answer that question for you by the end of this series. We will, we will, I, I mean, just to be literally, we, I listen to some music sometimes and think to myself, yeah, I might play a clip of that for GBC to say this is where we're headed. Now, where we head is dependent on God providing the people. <coughs> We worship based on the gifts God brings into our church family. So we don't get to force that kind of change. But uh, if if you want to know where we would like to head in gathered worship as God continues to provide people, we will tell you pretty pretty directly, but not yet. (laughs) Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. And just, it is such a privilege to pastor this sweet church family that doesn't gather around complete agreement about these things. We gather about Christ, a love for his word, and a desire to just honor you as a church family. Not the one church that's doing it all right, just a church that's seeking to honor you with a very diverse group of people, which is beautiful and we love it and we praise you for it. So continue to guide us. We just want to follow the head of the church who is Christ and do all that he would have us to do. We pray in his name. Amen.